week pick up number one of this revelation? Or was it Wednesday morning? Anyway, it's a five-disc series. And they only took number one. <laughs> so they're back there saying, what is this? If anybody else wants it, they're here for the free taking. Um, there's a few books down here if you want. They're not free. So we'll tell you later. Okay, welcome to everybody. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks. Thanks that we can come together openly. We can come together in your name. We can shout out to others that you are our Lord and Savior. Guide us as we look at the final things of this life and help us to understand that it's just the beginning. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Okay, uh, glad that all of you are here. Uh, we thank you. I'm going to do tonight kind of like what I did last week with the Dead Sea Scrolls, start with an overview, a very quick overview of the book of Revelation, uh, but you can turn to like chapter 15 or 16 at any time, and we'll get in there and start doing a straight Bible study, which will give you a taste of the kind of Bible study that I normally do, and I will be doing in November with Matthew. But before we leave today, Deacon Bruce is going to share with you what he's going to do next month uh, on St. Paul. Now, I promised to keep my wife at home and I would come. Uh, those of you who have been in my class before know of her love for St. Paul and <laughs> or lack thereof. But uh, anyway, do you have the microphone there for questions? We're, we're all set then. Okay. Um, so this is the end of our four-week sampler of the kind of classes we teach. And then uh, Bruce will be teaching next month, every Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, on St. Paul. And I'm going to let him tell you about it later because he's told me enough about it that I'm going to be here. So uh, I trust that you will too. And um, in November, then I will do um, the Gospel of Matthew because that's what all the Gospels are going to be from in the coming year uh, in church. In December, then he'll pick up some specifics about some of St. Paul's letters. Is that right, Bruce? Okay, so far so good. Okay, let's begin with, um, oh, you got to turn it on, Dean. All right, there. Okay, we're going to look, I'm going to close this door. How's the temperature for everybody? Okay, if you get too hot or too cold, I don't think you get too cold, but... Um, I've got it up at 76 right now. We're going to take a look at the revelation of Jesus Christ to St. John. Eternal life is at the end or the beginning. And we'll approach this through a study of the last five or six chapters of the Bible. So here's a quick introduction because there are some terms that I'll be using that uh, we need to be aware of, of which we need to be aware uh, the word apocalypse, which you've all heard somewhere along the line in a movie or somewhere. Apocalypse is Greek. Revelation is Latin. Unveiling is the English translation as best we can make of those other two. So when we talk about the apocalypse or talk about revelation, that's what we're talking about. And this is a big thing with me um, over and over again. I've only taught Revelation, who knows, 10, 12 times at least, um, and written a couple books on it. One of them's up here. Uh, it's the revelation of Jesus 
to St. John. The revelation of Jesus to St. John on the island of Patmos, which is just in the Aegean Sea across about 30 miles from Ephesus. Uh, it was a prison at the time that John was there at Ephesus. Uh, it was kind of a political prison, as best we can figure out, political, theological, not for killers and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it was there that he received this revelation and wrote it down. And so it's a revelation of Jesus to St. John. You'll hear people talk about, have you read Revelations yet? Do you know what John's revelation says? No, it's Jesus Christ's revelation to St. John. Hate to make a big deal out of that, but I do. Okay, there's all kinds of things that occur in the book of Revelation. Numbers, colors, symbols, and drama. And other things as well. Um, you'll have numbers. Um, you have number three. You'll have four. You'll have seven. We might talk about those tonight. You have 12. You have 10. You have a millennium. All that kind of stuff. Uh, Colors. Let me give you a very good example of color. It comes with the four horsemen of the apocalypse. If you're aware of that, in the sixth chapter of the book of Revelation, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the first one is a white horse. It means they're going to battle. That's the steed. The second horse is the red horse. If you go to battle, there's going to be bloodshed. The third horse is black. Why? Because you take people and go to battle, take them out of the fields, and you're going to have a famine because there'll be nobody creating any goods. And the fourth horse is a pale horse, which stands for being dead. And so you go white, red, black, and pale. That's just a, an idea of an understanding of the colors. That's chapter 6. Uh, symbols. There are lots of different symbols. We'll probably talk about some tonight. And drama. John gets involved. The writer gets involved in the drama of his vision. You know, he'll turn to see what's going on. Um, he'll speak some things. And he's involved in this. A Christophany. You don't need... Uh, know any more than this. There are three Christophanies in the book of Revelation. Uh, that's where, to the best of his ability, he gives you a picture of Christ. And so we will get a picture. We're not going to read it tonight because we don't have time. But the picture of Christ that comes uh, in the first four chapters, actually the first chapter of Revelation, uh, then is... You know, he's got the golden shoes and the breastplate and all that kind of things. Then when he writes to the seven churches, note the number seven, when he writes to seven churches, he applies one of those pieces out of the Christophany. Uh, Ophany is a picture of something. So if you see a theophany, it's a picture of God. A Christophany is a picture of Christ. Um, it's that... That simple and that difficult, yeah. The number seven occurs in the book of Revelation more than 50 times. More than 50 times. It's there over and over again. There are many series. Okay, giving you a quick outline so that you see that even though we're going to pick it up at about the 15th, 16th chapter, um, this is what it looks like. There's an introduction where John says, I was a prisoner of the Lord on the island of Patmos, and so on. Then he has letters to seven churches. These are letters that apply, apply to what's going on in the churches that John founded around Ephesus. And so those seven churches are lined up in the way that, say, a Pony Express writer today would, would take the message. So you go Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. And I always tell the story that I memorized those from my doctorate when I had to defend it, and they never asked me. So.
Chapters 4 and 5 are a worship scene where you see the throne of God, and that's going to come back up uh, when we get to the end, as we're talking. Seven seals. Actually, at the end of the worship scene, John weeps because he can't find anybody that can open the seals. And then an angel of the Lord comes and opens the seals. Then there are seven trumpets. Following that, there's a power struggle. Maybe I better go back here and say in the seven seals, the end of times, the end of times is depicted in a partial way. In other words, a third of the river is turned to blood and a third of this goes bad. And so everything is partial till you get to the seven trumpets. Now at the seven trumpets, it becomes permanent. It becomes total. The power struggle takes place. That's an interesting. Many, many scholars, many writers have said there are seven parts to the power struggle. I prefer not to get involved in seven parts to the power struggle, other than it's a struggle between good and evil. And we have seven bowls. We'll start right there tonight. The final judgment and an eternal dwelling. That gives you the whole overall outline. Does everybody have that on an, an outline that was up here on the table? Okay, or back there. Okay, we're going to look, first of all, at the cycle of seven bowls. So if you turn to the 15th chapter of Book of Revelation, which is easy to find, it's way in the back. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. In case you're um, interested, we, uh, we offered last week for those people who are interested in a Lutheran study Bible that looks like this, we could get you one for $20. And three people took us up on that, so we ordered five. So if you're interested, we've got a couple more copies up here for $20. The cycle of seven bowls. Remember I talked about the power struggle in the outline. So the previously the final judgment was like a drama. Now this depiction of the judgment is a cycle of seven. Because it's final, there's an elaborate preparation. So let's look at the 15th chapter of the revelation of Jesus Christ to St. John. Then I saw another portent in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is ended. I've been asked why we have to have three different depictions of the end of time in the book of Revelation, uh, which you have with the trumpets and then the struggle and then the, the, the bowls. That's because if you don't get it this way, maybe you'll get it that way. If you don't get it that way, you might get it this way. So uh, we try to work our way around there. First two, and this is why for those of you who might be new, why I do the reading is that uh, some people don't like to read out loud, and I like to jump in the middle of a sentence and say something. So that's why it makes it easy for me to read. And I saw, verse 2, what appeared to be a sea of glass mixed with fire. And those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name. Who knows the number of the beast? 666. Six, six. Uh, I don't think I really have time to go into that. Let's just say seven is the perfect number. It combines three, the spiritual number, and four, the earthly number, you know, north, east, south, and west, four corners of the earth. So take three, the spiritual number, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, add it together with four corners of the earth, you have seven, the perfect number. 666 is just a little less than perfect. It's got problems. 
Okay. And I saw what appeared, I'll pick it up again. I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God. Great and amazing are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, kings of nations. Lord, who will not fear and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your judgments have been revealed. This recalls the, the joy of Moses um, that you find in the 15th chapter of the Old Testament book of Exodus. And you'll find other uh, revelations here relating to the Old Testament. Verse 5. After this I looked, and the temple of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. And out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues, robed in pure bright linen with golden sashes across their chests. Then one of the four living creatures they were introduced way back at the throne scene in chapter 2. Uh, one of the four living creatures gave the seven angels seven golden bowls full of what? The wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were ended. So here you see seven occurring over and over again. Let's go to chapter 16, because now that was your introduction. Then I heard a loud voice. OK. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured his bowl on the earth, and a foul and painful sore came on those who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped its image. You know, at that time that John was recording this vision was a time when there was lots of idol worship. And so those who worshipped the, the uh, image of the beast uh, were those who also worship the idols. Did your glasses come apart, Dave? Yeah, they did. Oh, you'll fix it. Okay, I'm glad. I didn't want to give up mine. Okay. <laughs> now watch how quickly this happened. There's six bowls, an inner, then an interlude, then the seventh bowl is poured, but there's a long preparation that we already read, then really short details. Watch this. Chapter 16, verse 2. So the first angel went and poured his bowl on the earth, and a foul and painful sore came on those who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped its image. So it's important on whom it's poured. Second angel, verse 3, poured his bowl into the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and every living thing in the sea died. The third angel poured his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water say, You are just, O Holy One, who are and who were, for you have judged these things. Because they shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, Yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, your judgments are true and just. We're going to talk about results here. And they're very reminiscent of what happened in Egypt, the plagues of Egypt in Exodus chapters 7 through 11. So we're talking about each in each condition. We're going to talk about where, on whom it's poured, what it is, the earth beast, followers, sores and boils, 
and then it's poured in the sea and it turns to blood. Poured in the rivers and drinking water, and that's turned to blood also. Chapter, verse 8. The fourth angel poured his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat, but they cursed the name of God, who had authority over these plagues, and this becomes the key now, and they did not repent and give him glory. They did not repent and give him glory. So the sun comes and it scorches the earth. The fifth angel poured his bowl on the throne of the beast and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and sores and what? They did not repent of their deeds. The sixth angel poured his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up in order to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And I saw three foul spirits like frogs coming from the mouth of the dragon, from the mouth of the beast, and from the mouth of the false prophet. These are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. And you've all heard of the great battle of Armageddon that's going to take place. See, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and is clothed. Does that remind you of Jesus and uh, the, yeah, the maidens who were, some of them fell asleep and some of them waited. And Jesus said, stay awake. Blessed is the one who stays awake and is clothed not going about naked and exposed to shame. John tells us the way it is. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon, which is Hebrew Armageddon. So we have one throne on the beast throne. Then we have the river Euphrates. So there's six places that those plagues are placed. And this reminds us of the sixth trumpet and the invaders of the east. That's why the river Euphrates, the, the great river along which the city of Babylon was located, which they knew had conquered their people back in the fifth century BC, that uh, they would be aware of that. So, we have the interlude of the frogs and the battle of Armageddon. Verse 13, there are three evil spirits like we had in chapters 12 through 14. There's a lot of repetition in the book of Revelation. The dragon represents evil, devil. The beast is the sea beast. What other kind of beast is there? There's the earth beast. If you've taken uh, my class on Revelation before, you have a sea beast and an earth beast. The sea beast is evil, the devil, whatever you want to call it. And the earth beast are those who serve it, such as government. Uh, the government of the Roman Empire served the sea beast in order to keep it going. And so we won't see the earth beast. Uh, I'm trying to think, but... I doubt it. Well, the false prophet. So that's the earth beast. So there are the three evil spirits that we encounter in chapter 16, verses 13 through 16. It shows to us the failure of evil. And this verse 15 is the great day. That which we fear most because it appears to me mighty, becomes only a spawning of sickly creatures. And so instead of taking over the world, becoming, they just rivet, rivet. There they are. They just become frogs. Okay. Now, the seventh angel poured his bowl, verse 17, in the air, 
And a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, It is done. And there came flashes of lightning, rumbles, peals of thunder, and a violent earthquake such as had not occurred since people were upon the earth. So violent was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. God remembered great Babylon and gave her the wine cup of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found. And huge hailstones, each weighing about a hundred pounds, dropped from heaven on people until they cursed God for the plague of that hail. So fearful was that plague. Okay. I have to say a few words about when you read the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ to St. John. Be careful that you don't just take it literally. You know, that's what Timothy LaHaye did, and he published 13 books and became a millionaire. Um, but see it symbolically, that that's what it's doing to the evil of the world. God is going to win. Not necessarily do we have to put out a movie where there's 800-pound hailstones falling from heaven. But it's just a way of depicting, of showing you the power of God, the strength of God. Any questions at that point? OK. So we have the seventh bowl. The interlude prepared us now in chapter 16, but we now get to uh, verses 17 to 21 of chapter 16. The seventh angel, now watch closely what the seventh angel does. The seventh angel poured his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, It is done. And there came flashes of lightning, rumbles, peals of thunder, blah, said blah, blah, blah. The great city was split into parts. Verse 20. Every island fled away, and huge hailstones. This is the interlude prepared us. Now are you ready? But the key to me is not the hailstones or the earthquake or anything like that. Where is the seventh bowl poured? In the air. In the air. And I'll talk more about it in, in a little bit. But when the air is gone, what is there? Yeah. I, I was question. wondering why um, John used reference to Babylon in this place. He, was his reference referencing Babylon a code for Rome? Yes, yes. Um, you could ask me that at home, but this is I'm glad you waited till here. Uh, yeah, Babylon, of course, was the great city in three, four, five hundred BC. And they were, the, they were a country. And they took over Judah and took all the leaders of Judah, which is Jerusalem and uh, Bethlehem and Jericho, took all those leaders captive for over 50 years to the city of Babylon. Then they were released to go back. But not all of them went. Some of them had married off with <coughs> Babylon women and and so it becomes a real hassle when they get back to rebuild the temple and bring God back into their presence. Ezra and Nehemiah are the two prophets of the Old Testament that you can read that give you that whole story. Somebody says uh, uh, Ezra was the architect and Nehemiah was the construction manager. Uh, but it tells you the struggle that they go through in trying to rebuild the temple. So Babylon was always seen as evil in the eyes of the Israelites, in the eyes of the believers. And of course, John is in Asia Minor when he's writing this. Um, so Babylon is there, but the air is destroyed. Life is gone. When the air is gone, life is gone. And the judgments of God 
are complete. There's no more after that. Why did this happen? I thought I took care of that this afternoon. Okay, so we're going to go through the episodes, the various episodes of the final judgment in chapter 17 through 20. I may skip a little bit, but we'll see how it goes. I'll watch the clock. Chapter 17. Then one of the seven angels, angels, remember, are intermediaries between heaven and earth. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come. And see, now notice how John gets involved here. Come, I will show you the judgment of the great whore who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and with the wine of whose fornication the inhabitants of the earth have become drunk. It shows you at this point how Rome had just taken over the world. Rome had just taken over the then known world. And so this is how it's depicted. Verse 3. So he carried me away. See, John getting involved here. Carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names. And it had seven heads and ten horns. Seven again being the complete number. Ten being a large round number. Um, the reason we say 10 is a large round number, in those days, 10 was a day's journey, 10 miles, kilometers, whatever they used in those days, and five was a Sabbath day's journey. So this is 10, just a lot, that's all. Verse four, the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her fornication. And on her forehead was written a name, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of whores and of earth's abominations. And I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the witnesses to Jesus. You probably didn't know there was that kind of language in the Bible, did you? Talking about all of them. Um, but Babylon, Rome, Babylon was known for its many temples, for one thing. Uh, many of the major cities of the Roman Empire had temples that were depicted to other gods. And it was known that in those temples there was a lot of hanky paint going on. Uh, how else do I say it? Uh, <laughs> How many have been to Athens, Greece, here? Been to Athens, you've been up to the Parthenon, right? Up there, the Temple of Diana, up there, and the Temple, the Parthenon, is really the Temple of Athena, for which the city of Athens is named. And right there on the hill, there's various temples. And so you would find them throughout the Middle East. So, Revelation is concerned with the judgments of God. Judgment has to do with both the destruction of evil and the salvation of those who put their trust in God. Let's see if we pick up some of that um, at the end there of verse 8. Is it 6? And when I saw her, I was greatly amazed. But the angel said to me, why are you so amazed? See, John saw her. I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with the seven heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to ascend from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the inhabitants of the earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, will be amazed when they see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. There are scholars who believe this is the theme and the basic outline of the book of Revelation. That very 
small verse there at A, the beast because it was and is not and is to come. So the people of God will always be in contention with evil of the world. Verse nine, and many scholars go into great details to end up that this ends up with Domitian, um, the emperor Domitian, who was right about this time, 90 AD. Verse 9, this calls for a mind that has wisdom. Okay, here's, here's your, um, let's see what the judgment has to say here first. Okay. In chapters 9 to 11, the judgments were partial. In 12 to 14, the judgment is final. In 15 and 16, the judgment is a numbered cycle of God's wrath in bowls, which is what we just read. And now 17, we're going to get a whole picture. We're going to lay out what all took place in 15 and 16 of the final judgment becomes the greatest spectacle of all. Verse 9, this calls for a mind that has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. What is Rome sometimes called? The city of seven hills. Also, they are seven kings, of whom five have fallen, one is living, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth that belongs to the seventh and goes to destruction. Now I want you all to go home and try to figure that out. <laughs> I spent a long time on that. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received the kingdom, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. These are united in yielding their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the lamb. Ah, there's a familiar figure. And the lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. Verse 15, and I'll stop at the end of the chapter. And he said to me, The waters that you saw, where the whore is seated, are peoples, multitudes, and nations and languages. People, multitudes, nations, languages. The whole earth. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the whore. They will make her desolate and naked. They will devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to carry out their evil, their purpose, his purpose, by agreeing to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. Now just look up at verse 16 for a minute. Uh, not 16. I'll find it here. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Oh, I forgot that I started reading at 9. Um, verse 11. Go to verse 11. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. Um, it was and it is not. This probably, the best of our ability, refers to Nero. Nero was known for persecuting the church. Nero hung St. Paul upside down. Nero chopped off Peter's head. That's how Pete, Nero was anti-church. Um, and then we have one other emperor that comes in, and then calm sets in for a little while. But then you have a couple of nephews who get to fighting over who's going to be on the throne next, and they only last for a couple of months. That's it. And so then Domitian becomes the next emperor. And many thought that Domitian was Nero reincarnated. There's a whole theory about uh, Nero redivivus that is 
Domitian was the recreation of Nero because he persecuted the church as well. So there's lots of little things to see in there. Um, I don't know how else to tell you. We're doing this in one night, and I, I've taught this course sometimes three weeks, sometimes four weeks, sometimes eight weeks. Um, but you can really get into details on it. Um, if you're interested, yes, I do have a book up here um, that some famous scholar wrote. <laughs> there is a story about that book. That book was written in 1999. So it's 19 years old. Um, I wrote it when I was in South Carolina. Uh, you all recall dot matrix printers? That book was printed on dot matrix first time. Um, I gave the rough copy. It's only about 98 or 100 pages. I gave the rough, rough copy to Peg to edit. <clears throat> when she gave it back to me, there was more red ink and there was black ink. And I almost said, to heck with it. I, I was very close. But I said, well, you've come this far. You've studied this book for 30 years now. You really ought to put it in the print in a different way. I did have another book out, um, Face the Future with Faith, but uh, that was not as popular because it was too complicated. So this is a very simplified look at the book of Revelation. But it was only grammar and punctuation. You make it sound like it was awful, but it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, she still corrects my grammar and punctuation. OK, so we're looking at this picture of the final judgment, and it's the greatest spectacle of all. Um, look at chapter 18. We get into kind of a poetic. Uh, approach to the fall of Babylon. Um, it's a funeral hymn. It's a dirge. It's going to tell you all the people that are going to have problems. Uh, oh, just look at verse 9. And the kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand far off in fear of her torture and say, Alas, alas, the great city, Babylon, the mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. Now look who all gets involved. Verse 11. The merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her because no one buys their cargo anymore. Cargo of gold, silver, jewels, and pearls fine linen, purple, silk, and scarlet, all kinds of scented wood, articles of ivory, all articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, olive, choice flour, and wheat, cattle, and sheep, horses and chariots, slaves, and human lives. Wow, that's quite a list. I've never had room on one of these slides to put that list. Never thought about that. Verse 14, for the fruit, the fruit for which your soul longed has gone from you, and all your dainties <laughs> and your splendor are lost to you, never to be found again. The merchants of these wares who gained wealth from her will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud. Alas, alas, the great city clothed in fine linen, in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, with jewels, and with pearls. For in one hour, all this wealth has been laid waste. OK, we, got, we just took care of all the merchants of the earth. Now look at 17b. And all shipmasters and seafarers, sailors, and all those whose trade is on the sea stood far off and cried as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city was like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads as they wept and mourned, crying out, Alas, alas, the great city, where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth. 
In one hour, she has been laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heaven, you saints. Now, notice the change here. We're not talking about all the bad things. Rejoice over her, O heaven, you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, with, each violent, with such violence, Babylon, the great city, will be thrown down and will be found no more. And the sound of harpists and minstrels and of flutists, flautists, and trumpeters will be heard in you no more. Artisans of any trade will be found in you no more. Sound of the millstone will be heard no more. Light of the lamp will shine in you no more. Voice of the bridegroom and the bride will be heard in you no more. Look how that, and in you, verse 24, was found the blood of the prophets and the saints and all who have been slaughtered on the earth. You can think in terms of the early Christians, looking back at the prophets of old, many who were, shall we say, shut up, uh, locked up, imprisoned, maybe even killed for their stance against the Roman government. Now that all starts with Julius Caesar, 323 BC, something like that and continues on till it falls in the second century. So we have um, all these people who are part of it, weeping and wailing. Um, here are the episodes. Have the harlot and the beast, judgment of the harlot, the hallelujah chorus. The hallelujah chorus is going to come up in chapter 19, and it's really neat, so we will read that. Fourth episode will be, ah, let's not get there yet. Let's stick with the Hallelujah Chorus. Look at chapter 19. Now, all of your names, you all have the same name right now. George Frederick Handel. I want you to think of yourself now as George Frederick Handel reading this chapter of Revelation. And after this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of the great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power threefold to our God, for his judgments are true and just. He has judged the great whore who corrupted the earth with his fur fornication, and he was avenged on her, he has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they said, Hallelujah, and the smoke goes up from her forever and ever, and the 24 elders, now you say, where did those elders come from? You have to go back and read chapters 2 and 3 to find out the elders that were around the throne of God. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you servants, and all who fear him, small and great. And then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the sound of many waters, like the sound of mighty thunder peals, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. You all know that as the astounding spectacular of the hallelujah chorus. Let the Lord God, the Almighty, reigns. So let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come. His bride has made herself ready. To her it has been granted to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. The righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then what does John do? I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, this is the angel, you must not do that. 
I am a fellow servant with you and your comrades who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So, there we have the Hallelujah Chorus, including the marriage feast of the Lamb, and now we get to the White Horseman, which is the fifth, how many episodes do you think there'll be? Seven. Seven, right. So we're at the fifth one, the White Horseman. Verse 11, chapter 19. Then I saw heaven opened, and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he is a name inscribed that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. This is a good spot to pause and say, who was this John who received this revelation from God, from Christ? How does the Gospel of John begin? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And if you jump down to the 14th verse, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, referring to Jesus. Verse 14, And the armies of heaven, wearing fair linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name inscribed, King of kings and Lord of lords, and he shall reign yeah, forever and ever. It's uh, People start asking at this point, well, why is God come in bludgeoning these people and, and getting them? You know, that's the only way that humans have of understanding war. Defeat and victory. They only un they don't understand it at the peace table. How many treaties have fallen apart? How many problems have occurred between nations? Just look at it that way and say, how are these things solved? Well, we have great wars. We start Civil War, World War One, World War Two, Korea, Vietnam. You know, just you know, in my lifetime, it's three wars. And, and the, the problems that you go through with those things. And so the way that it's depicted that God would be able to overcome that uh, is to defeat the beast and all of its armies. Verse 17. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly in midheaven, heaven Come. Gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of the mighty, the flesh of horses and their riders, the flesh of all, both free and slave, both small and great. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against the rider on the horse and against his army. Who's the rider on the horse, do you think? Jesus Christ. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who had performed in its presence the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and who had worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were killed by the sword of the rider on the horse, the sword that came from his mouth, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Don't have to say any more about that. Kind of gory, isn't it? Uh, but it shows the victory of the rider on the white horse. Now, I'm going to move on because we're going to come to, um, we got the destruction of the prophet, but you'll find this all the way through the book of Revelation. 
you will, whether it's the trumpets, whether it's the drama in the middle, whether it was the, the cups, whatever it is, you get one, two, three, four, five, six, boom, 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 and then you're just waiting for wham, and it doesn't happen. It's, it's a, an interlude. It's kind of like you've gone to the great symphony, and you've heard this music just build and build and build and build. I always use the, the uh, um, 1812 overture as an example. You know, it just builds and builds and builds and builds, and it gets to the point where it's ready to hear the cymbals crack, and da 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 You get this little interlude to fill in the blanks for the questions that people are going to ask, not musically, but biblically. And so we have an interlude right here in the millennium. So chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. I think I'm moving okay. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great, great chain. He seized the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him, you know, call him whatever you want, but he bound him for a thousand years. You've all heard of the millennium, right? And you've heard the evangelists on TV talk about whether we're in the millennium, whether we're not in the millennium. Um, see the millennium as a large number. 10 times 10 times 10. And you've got the millennium. Threw him into the pit and locked and sealed it over him so that he would deceive nations no more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be left out for a little while. Now, you have one school of thought today out there among the evangelists that say the millennium is over and we're in this very small period of time when evil once again is going to take hold for just a little while. Verse 4, Then I saw thrones, and those seated on them were given authority to judge. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony to Jesus and for the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. Over these the second death has no power, for they will be, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. So there are those who think we're in that thousand year reign right now. I am not among them. Okay. And now we get, well, I'm not quite there yet, but let's do 7 through 10 just in case. When the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to the deceive the nations at where? The four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog, in order to gather them for battle, they are numerous as the sands of the sea. They marched up over the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So now we'll get to the judgment from the throne. Verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and the one who sat on it. The earth and heaven fled from his presence and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Also another book was opened, the book of life. And the dead were judged, how? According to their works 
as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And all were judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Um, you know, you can, you can see this for its greatness or see it for its simplicity. Those who worship God overcome those who do not worship God. Um, just the story came to me as I was thinking about this story that I've told many times. Uh, I've all, even told this from the pulpit when I was uh, a stewardship director, but uh, so we can mark this one down. But there was this guy um, who died, uh, and uh, he was met by St. Peter at the gate. And St. Peter said, well, this guy was very rich, and he had a big company and all that, and had died very suddenly. And St. Peter said, what are you doing here? And the guy said, well, aren't I supposed to be here? And St. Peter said, well, what, what, what have you done? And the guy said, well, what good have I done? There were, oh, I know, there was a time when my wife headed up the Mother's March on polio. And so she said, we ought to contribute before she went out door to door. How many remember that? You give away your age. I remember that very clearly. Uh, and he said, so I put in a dollar. And out they went. St. Peter said to St. Michael, is that right? St. Michael goes, yeah, that's right. So St. Peter said, well, what else have you done? The guy said, well, um, you know, we uh, at my company, we decided to hire a director of human relations uh, and public relations. And she thought we ought to be 100% participants in United Way. Now, most of you should know what that means. Uh, you've been there and been in charge of some of those things. Um, and he said, so she came into me and she said, we want to be 100% United Way. Will you make the first contribution? He said, so I gave her a dollar. And St. Peter says to Michael, is that right, Michael? And Michael goes down the list. Yeah, that's right. And he said, well, what else have you done? I said, oh, I really don't know. St. Peter said to Michael, what do you think we ought to do? St. Michael said, give him his two bucks back and tell him we go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> when you used to be a stewardship director for five years, I know a lot of those stories. But I won't stop at that one. <laughs> Everybody laughed. Okay. Now we're into the interlude of the millennium with the binding and loosing of Satan for a thousand years. Um, this is chapter 20, verses 1 to 10. Millennium literally means 1,000 years. It seems to be a calm rest period. We're ready to take a deep new breath of life. And then, well, I can do it if I talk fast enough. Chapter 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding his hand, the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain. He seized the dragon, the ancient serpent. Didn't I read that? Okay. So we're now to 11. We're at 21? Gee, I'm going home. <laughs> You'll note, that, not that it's a big thing, but the angel, not Christ, is the one who does the binding. But it is not eternal until verse 10 when it becomes an eternal binding. Um, the devil who deceived him was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the prophet were already there. The martyrs come back to life, 
and we have that lake of fire, which is the ongoing reality of judgment, which symbolizes the lake of fire, lifetime separation from God. Now it's final. Okay. Once again, you've got to, if you really want to get the background on chapter 21, we're going to the new heaven and the new earth. You've got to go find out about the great white throne back in chapters 3 and 4 as it relates to worship, the throne of God, those who come before God, and the 12 seats around the throne. Um, it was interesting in, uh, in Ephesus, in the amphitheater of Ephesus, it seated about 5,000 people. Down in front, I tried very hard to count 12 thrones next to the great throne. And what happened in actual days in Ephesus and in other major cities is they would have a play or whatever they did in those days um, come in and the always was the major throne for the ruler, the cathedral, if you want to call it that. And then mayors of cities around would be called in to sit on the other 12 thrones. Now, in Ephesus, I couldn't quite come up with 12. Uh, one time I came up with 11. One time I came up with 13. But, it, you know, when you're uncovering something that's 2,000 years old, it's a little bit difficult sometimes. But if you look in the third and fourth chapter of the book of Revelation, you will find the story of the great white throne surrounded by elders. Um, this is the last of the last cycle centers where the visions of the first cycle began at the throne of God. It's victorious because it's white. No one is privileged here, great and small. We'll read those verses in just a minute. Judged by their deeds. You know, they asked Jesus, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you feed the hungry? When did we see you f give the thirsty something to drink? He says, inasmuch as you've done it unto the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you've done it to me. And so those are the deeds that we're talking about. Death and Hades are the place of the dead. The lake of fire is never put out in any apocalypse. In any apocalypse, if you want to look in some of the apocryphal books, or if you want to look in Daniel, whatever kind of apocalyptic literature you want to read, you'll find the lake of fire is never put out, which means God is active. God knows what's going on. So the second death is separation from God. Okay, we'll read this very quickly. Chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. You know, did, I, did I do verse 11, that section? Okay. First heaven and first earth, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem. What, what did they have to compare anything grand, with grandeur and wonder and marvelous? What did they have to compare it to? Well, the biggest, brightest, best city they knew was Jerusalem, the followers of Christ. And so it's called the New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, see, the home of God is among mortals. <laughs> to me, this is very important. The home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. That should help us reflect back, um, making all things new. 
to uh, creation. See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Those who conquer will inherit these things, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the polluted, the murderers, the fornicators, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And then we come in this chapter through 22 to the new heaven and the new earth. So we've established God's dwelling place and humankind's new life. Verse 9. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. What did Jesus talk about in the Gospels? That he would be the bridegroom and the church would be his bride. And in the spirit he carried me away to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem, what? Coming down out of heaven from God. It has the glory of God and a radiance like a very rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It has a great high wall with 12 gates. We'll talk about those in a moment. And at the gates, 12 angels. And on the gates are inscribed the names of what? The 12 tribes of the Israelites. And on the east, three gates, north, three gates, south, three gates, west, three gates. And the wall of the city has 12 foundations. And on them are the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Now, I, must, I just pause there. To, to say oftentimes, I, I have said, you know, if we look uh, after Judas goes out and hangs himself, we're left with what? Eleven apostles. And so all of a sudden, we get the other apostles get all together and say, now who are we going to get for number 12? And they got two pretty good guys here. Joseph Barsabbas, and Matthias. So who are we going to take with us? Now evidently 12 was pretty important because they rolled the dice to see who was going to be number 12. And it becomes Matthias. So someday if someone asks you, who is the one who didn't become the 12th apostle after Judas hung himself? You say Joseph Barsabbas. So you can always remember that. Never forget. I'll, I'll ask you in just a minute. Okay. We're in the details of the city. Um, verse 15. The angel who talked to me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. He measured the city with his rod 1,500 miles in its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which the angel was using. The wall is built of jasper, while the city is pure gold, clear as glass. The foundation of the wall of the city are adorned with every jewel. I won't go through all of them. Jump, drop down to uh, 21. And the 12 gates are 12 pearls. Each of the gates is a single pearl, and the street of the city is pure gold, transparent as glass. So here we see the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, and the first one of the first things we ought to see and remember is that it comes down from God to us. It comes down from God to us. Uh, why were the streets paved with gold? That's the greatest thing they knew in those days. They want to make this an extra special place. Why did they measure it? 
They wanted to see if everybody would fit in. Does that make you feel better? I mean, for those days, uh, that's a great, great size uh, city when you talk in terms of 1,500 miles, its length and its width. They couldn't imagine that kind of number. That was just humongous to them. And so that's why it's measured. But now verse 22 comes up with worship in the city. I saw no temple in the city. Saw no temple? Why? For its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon. See, now those are human questions. Say, how can we live in a city that doesn't have any sun to keep us warm at 96 degrees year-round, whatever? I think it's not going to go away. I don't know at the rate we're going. Uh, but the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it. Why? For the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. Here is where I'm talking about symbolism. This is symbolic that the glory of God is the light of the city. Verse 24, the nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day and there will be no night there. So the gates are never going to be shut. People will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And so, I'll go on the next five verses. The angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the land through the middle of the street of the city. Now, think how precious water was to those people in those days. They're living in very arid conditions. And now they're promised, the river's going to flow right through the middle of your city. On either side of the river is the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month, naturally. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Nothing accursed will be found there anymore. But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. And his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. And there will be no more night. They need no light of lamp or sun. For the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. And he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. For the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. See, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. And so there we see God's new dwelling place. And the word that's used here for new is Kainos. Kainos. Kainos means brand new. Neos is the other word for new, Greek word, and it means a neophyte or a novice. Any of you ever do any boxing? There were some novice divisions, those who had fought a few fights but weren't ranked yet, and they are novice boxers. Uh, that's the best way I can describe it. But this is the new, God's new dwelling place, is Kainos. And the sea was no more. It doesn't evolve. Verse 2. Look at verse 2 of chapter 22. If I am so good as to find it. That's the wrong thing. Oh, verse 22, verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So we got that. On either side of the river is the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit. Um, then we get down to verse 3. 
Nothing accursed will be found there anymore, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, which is often where they would put the sign of slaves, so the who you belong to at that in those days. There will be no more night, for they need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord will be their light. Okay. So the broken fellowship with God is restored. And once again, we are in a trust relationship with our Lord. I just happened to find that today and said, so let's throw that in there. Okay. Now we're, we've gotten to um, a renewed relationship here between people and God. Verses 5 and 6 talk about, I will make all things new. It is done. It's happened. Verses 7 and 8 is a contrast between the new life in God's presence and the situation outside. <coughs> Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Well, I'm back, back in 21. So then we talk about new life. The details of the new city with the emphasis on 12. <coughs> Measure it. Is it big enough? Pure gold surpasses our imagination. The precious stones, some people say, are symbolic. But boy, there's a bunch of them if you look there at how many there are uh, in chapter 21. And then, unbelievable, but the ways of God are beyond our imagination in verse 21. So, we'll finish it right here. Okay. So you read 1,500 miles. Yeah. Miles is the United States measurement. Meters were something that was in England. So what does the original text use as a measurement? I didn't bring my Greek Bible with me tonight, so I don't know what it said. I'd have to check it out. Michael? While you're looking that up, I think I'd be uh, talking about that. When you think God, why would you think God gave faith a second chance if you didn't make it down? Okay, say that last sentence again. I'm just thinking it's um, interesting why, why did God give Satan a second chance, another chance, before he destroyed him at the end of the millennium? Was, it, was we people would probably still going say, bad? We would probably say because God wants everyone to have that chance to repent of evil. My Bible notes say uh, in Greek it was 12,000 stadia. Stadia, right. And every measurement of that city is divisible by 12. Right. Very good. Yeah, it does. The, the old version comes back now as soon as you say that, stadia. Okay, let's look at worship in the holy city, and we'll go through 22, verse 5. We've got seven minutes to go here. Okay, I've already read all that. So we'll turn now to what? No temple. The lamb is its lamp, that symbolic picture of security and safety. Twelve gates, no night. You know, that's when robbers and bad people came around in those days. The lamb's book of life is there. Worship cannot be removed from the stream of the river of life. And that's where we found when the angel shows me the river of the water of life. Fruit is from the tree of life. Just have to throw that in. You see, heaven is not sitting up there in the clouds somewhere. They shall see his face. What a glorious picture we have at this point. My love of butterflies is right there. The butterfly is a symbol of the resurrection, of course. 
and we get to this beautiful picture that relates back to creation. There's a river with what? The tree of life on both sides of the river. What happened in the Garden of Eden? There was what? One tree of life from which you could not eat, which was the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. First man and first woman did it. One of them decided they got hungry and it looked kind of juicy. I, you, and you all know that you've had me before that I don't believe this hogwash about apples uh, or bananas or pomegranates or whatever. It's the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Fruit always being the end result. So it's free, fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so it goes beyond our understanding. It's beyond our understanding that God would now place two of them. Did any of you grow up in a city like I did where you had the south side of the tracks? Yeah. I, some people are kind of just nodding. But yeah, we had the south side of the tracks where supposedly the poor lived and where the city dump was and some of that stuff. Um, but now we've got the tree of life on both sides. The throne of God and of his lamb and his servants will worship him. So here comes our conclusion, and I'm just going to conclude it quickly. I am coming soon is repeated three times. Blessed are those who live these words. Don't worship the messenger, but worship God. The eternal state is fixed by your earthly life, your deeds of what you try to do. How is that described here? It simply says, verse 10, And he said to me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book. For the time is near. Let the evildoers still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. So your eternal state is fixed by what you're doing in your earthly life. Then we get down to the seventh blessing, verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes, for they will have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. And then we have a whole list of the bad people who are outside. Look who's kept out. Dogs, sorcerers, sexual sinners, murderers, idolaters, and liars. The people of the Roman Empire who followed the emperor. Then we have a wonderful final invitation and a strong warning at the end. That used to always worry me. That... Uh, you look at verse 18, the strong warning says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away the person's share in the eternal whatever it is. So, two minutes. When, where, and how will this happen? Jesus said, No one knows a day or hour will come. Even the angels in heaven and the Son don't know. Only the Father knows. And then, New Testament description of death, just two places we can find it easily. The daughter of the synagogue leader, if you recall, Go away, Jesus says, for the girl is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at Jesus, but she was alive. And then Stephen, he knelt down and said, Lord, don't hold this sin against him. And when he had done it, he died. Then he appeared, St. Paul says, to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are alive, although some have died. And so the word death was a part of their vocabulary. So what about the transition? I love St. Paul. 
1 Corinthians 15. It's a great resurrection chapter in the whole Bible. Verses 50 to 52 say, What I am saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I'll tell you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, my favorite phrase, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Death has been swallowed up in victory. So those are quotes from Isaiah and Hosea. So where does that leave us today? I love the twinkling of an eye. To me, it matters not whether we've been dead four hours, four years, or thousands of years. I started thinking about that today uh, when I was typing this out and said, let's see, my dad has been gone for 46 years, for 46 years. My mother's been gone for 18 years. Um, does that mean they're in the ground and they're thinking about, gee, how long do I have to stay here under this dirt? You know, uh, that's not a twinkling of an eye. For them, whenever they're raised, it will be the twinkling of an eye. From the moment of death until the time of resurrection is the twinkling of an eye. So whether it's one day, one hour, one century, uh, for you see, without breath or livability, remember the, the cup, earthly life is gone. And with that, time becomes the twinkling of an eye if life is gone. Thus, we can say someone has passed on, someone has crossed the threshold of life, someone has departed this life. Hang with me one minute, and we'll tell you, I'm going to share with you now what I believe. And what I think, there's no, this is not written in any great Lutheran book in heaven, believe me. <laughs> Each of us is left with our own imaginations because of the promises of God. And we cannot understand this mystery since it was not in God's purpose in creation. How did God create human beings, man and woman? He created them to live forever as long as they kept their hands off the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So, Jesus says at the end, yes, I am coming soon, and we can pray, come Lord Jesus. That's how I see it. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, amen. Wow, I got it all in there. <laughs> oh, okay. I have to tell you just a very brief, a little account of something that happened a couple of years ago. We haven't pinned down the date yet, but uh, I mentioned Peg's grandfather, who was a pastor and a chaplain in one of my sermons. Um, and coming out of church was a gal I had never seen or met before, and she says, how did Peg spell her grandfather's name? And I said, R-E-C-H-E-R, -E Wrecker. She said, so did my grandfather. Now, she was from California. We've always been in the Midwest. So she says, we'll get together. And they did get together within the next week. Uh, and their grandfathers were brothers. OK, so last week, two more cousins came on the scene. And the four of them went out to eat. And they wanted a copy of the sermon that I had written where I said that. I have been through 2015, 2006, 2017, and I know it was not 2018. So in doing so, I came across a sermon that I preached in 2016. And what's its entitled? Uh, what is heaven like? What is heaven like? So I made a copy for all of you. Um, who'd like to take one as you leave. Go in peace. Wait a minute. Bruce, give Bruce the microphone. Let him say a couple words about next week. 
All right, I'm just going to keep you for just a second. I just want to kind of let you know that we're going to begin a series on the Apostle Paul next week. And it's probably going to go through October and continue into December. We probably actually won't be getting into the letters until after Christmas because there's so much material. But next week, we're going to look at why we want to study Paul. So for those of you who come next week, I do want to kind of uh, make it a little interactive to talk about why you would think studying Paul would be important. I have my reasons, and I'll be <laughs> presenting those. And we're going to move on to look at a lot of other things about Paul, a lot of background before we actually get into the letters. Uh, I do want to let you know that we are not going to have class on October the 23rd, which is Pastor Ronnie's installation. So in talking to both he and Pastor Mark, we decided to cancel it that night and also on Wednesday because we don't want to uh, give an unfair advantage to those who come on Wednesday. So we will be canceling <laughs> that one week in October. So look forward to seeing everybody next week as we continue on. Thank you all. Thank you. Go in peace. I'll answer questions. <laughs>